Australia, the US, Canada, France, Spain, New Zealand, Indonesia, and Brazil. I welcome you all to this edition of our policy dialogue session focused on the challenges of uh, insurgencies in Africa and how this affects the African Union's target of silencing the guns in the continent. Um, a warm welcome also to our live audience, uh, the guest speaker, uh, our panelists, our academic partners and media partners who are all streaming this event um, live on their different um, individual uh, media platforms across the continent. Thank you for honoring our invitation and for being here today. Um, so you may be wondering, for those of you who are not familiar with what we do at the conversation, maybe wondering, so what's the conversation and what do we do? We are a news and analysis media organization. We work with academics and, and scientists. We help them to translate and publish their research and insights into um, everyday language. And, and we help them share these insights with the rest of the world and the, and the wider public on our website and other, uh, other media platforms. Um, and content that we publish are freely accessible to, to everyone and to, to our, our media publishers as well. Our work and our mission is to increase the visibility of African scientists and researchers and to make sure that the world of knowledge and research that often remains only within university corridors or complex peer-to-peer -peer journals um, are now placed in the hands of members of the public, as well as policy community who can use these important uh, insights to make better decisions and facilitate evidence-based policies, which is, as you all know, much needed on our continent. Since we launched in 2015, the Conversation as Africa has published over 4,700 scientists and researchers, and their combined articles have been read over 90 million times worldwide, proving that our communities, our societies, our continents want to hear from experts who know what they are talking about. It also proves that scientific and research voices matter. Uh, about this dialogue, we this dialogue session you know, is in addition to our website, is a platform that we've set up to um, connect policymakers and academic experts. It's one of the ways by which we seek to bridge the often wide you know, gulf between the academia and the policymaker. We're seeking to provide a platform for scientists and researchers to share their insights and to bring them together with policymakers, the media and members of the public to discuss important topics of the day. The topic of discussion today focuses on the challenge of insurgencies across different parts of Africa. Uh, and of course, the impact of this security challenge on human capital development and the quality of life on the continent cannot be overemphasized. The insights and ideas that will be shared here today are expected to be useful, not only for governments and citizens of affected countries, but also the African Union as an institution and the rest of the international community. This is why I strongly believe that your time here with us today will be well spent. Once again, welcome everyone. I will now hand over to Benga to take us to the rest of the proceedings. Thank you very much, uh, Dijon, for that uh, introduction. And um, once again, thank you all for joining us today. If you've just joined, you're on the Conversation Africa's uh, policy dialogue uh, titled Insurgencies in Africa, Silence in the Guns. Now, in the last decade, particularly, there has been a sharp rise in the number of insurgencies on the African continent. Since 2019, there's been at least 15 countries with active armed conflicts in sub-Saharan Africa. These countries are Burkina Faso, Burundi, uh, Cameroon, the Central African Republic, Chad, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mozambique, Niger, Niger, Somalia, South Sudan, and Sudan. The conflict dynamics and ethnic and religious tensions were often uh, rooted in a combination of state weakness, corruption, ineffective delivery of basic services, and uh, competition over natural resources, inequality, and also a sense of marginalization. Now, joining us uh, this afternoon, uh, depending on uh, where you're watching us from across the world, is His Excellency Ambassador William Awinado Kairige, who's the Senior Advisor to the African Union Commissioner for Political Peace and Security, to tell us just a bit more on, uh, ambas uh, on the ambassador. Ambassador Awinado Kairige assumed the role of senior 
advisor to the African Union Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in February 2022. He's a retired career diplomat with 31 years of experience. Before this appointment, he was a private consultant uh, focusing on research and capacity building in the areas of governance, strategy planning, diplomacy, peace building, youth mentorship, regional integration and development. He was, he was Ghana's ambassador to Ethiopia, a permanent representative of the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, High Commissioner of Ghana to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and concurrently accredited to the Republic of Cameroon as well as permanent representative to ECOWAS between September 2014 and June 2017. Uh, well, welcome once again, Ambassador. Now, over to you for your keynote address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We need to unmute uh, Ambassador's device. Uh, Ambassador, we can't hear you. Could you kindly unmute your device? Uh, or can media help with that? Thank you. Apologies for that. Can, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, Ambassador, we can hear you. Thank you. I had a challenge. I don't know what I touched. <laughs> I it, it's fine. So now I'm back, and I will say... Yes, we're, we're loud and clear. Yeah, you couldn't hear me, but I was saying that I'm one of those that you call BBC, born before computer. So sometimes <laughs> I'm like you, the young and energetic ones. But uh, uh, Yinka, thank you very much, and uh, Ade also thanks for the... Uh, remarks uh, very I mean, uh, pointed and uh, I mean, introductory remarks to this session. Uh, I would like uh, to begin by first of all conveying the sincere regrets of my Commissioner Ambassador Bankule Adioye, who would have loved to do this personally, but because of prior commitments, he's unable to do so and has therefore tasked me to stand in for him. And uh, uh, it's an interesting uh, platform you have there, a, a very exciting brand. Uh, I don't know whether you appreciate it as much as I do, but uh, your focus and thrust is complete in sync with the commissioner's priorities in terms of uh, uh, bridging the gap between research, knowledge, policy making, and implementation, which is what Conversations is trying to do. And like Yinka mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, to do so uh, by publishing in uh, simple language, which is also another touch that co the commissioner I mean, is trying to promote, simple language. Because sometimes, I'm sure you realize that some of us African practitioners and intellectuals, we tend to use language that does not help to reach the people who should normally be receiving uh, the outputs that we are trying to produce. So I'm happy that you said one of your approaches is to do so in simple language. I hope, I mean, in uh, simple language, not just simple English or simple French, but also to consider languages like Pidgin, which are cross-border languages, uh, languages like Kiswahili, I'm talking about African languages, okay. Arabic, for some people, uh, they may not realize that Arabic is as African as its uh, Middle Eastern I mean, language, uh, and among other I mean, uh, languages. So we'll encourage you to do that. Uh, specifically, your topic also I mean, coincides not only with the uh, focus of uh, the commissioner's department, that is political affairs, peace and security, but the entire African I mean, Union. And so uh, he would like me to congratulate you and to assure you that 
I mean, this is being taken seriously and hopes that moving forward, we can work together I mean, to make your work easier so that you can in turn make our work easier for the good of this great continent that is being made to wait, to wait at the extreme cost. But happily, the African youth, both at home and in the, in the diaspora, I think are poised with the digital revolution to make it happen and to tell our generation that if we have failed, we are not going to fail in delivering to the next I mean, generation. So it's against this backdrop that I, mean, I would like us to um, have this conversation about this very important I mean, topic. First of all, by trying to recall what the trend is on our continent, the backdrop, the continental backdrop and the global backdrop of the topic that we're about to discuss. And you know that uh, it is not a very positive image and uh, our continent is facing very serious challenges, perhaps more than ever before. But as the Chinese would say, challenges are opportunities. They are not obstacles. And through innovation, which is the gift of the young, through innovation, which is the gift of our, our girls and mothers, multitasking, leveraging the digital revolution, I think we have hope that we, it will not be business as usual. And it is so uh, unfolding. Look at the continent where, I mean, uh, 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 I did mention I mean, earlier, I think, about these cross-border challenges we are facing, all kinds of cross-border vices, which were happening all over the decades. And we did not respond as forcefully as we should have. And they say little drops of water make the great ocean. The same with little drops of uh, crime, petty crime, unattended to become a great ocean of serious threats to our stability and survival. And this is the situation in which we are finding ourselves with insurgencies. It didn't start with insurgencies. It started little by little to bring us where we are. I recall in my days at ECOWAS, um, during Dr. Chambers' time, as you mentioned, I had the privilege of uh, being seconded to be his chief of staff. And it happened to be one of our partners who um, were embedded in the ECOWAS Commission, the Department of Peace and Security at the time, who mentioned something, and this is at the beginning of uh, the deck, um, millennium, that this Sahelian region, because of the ungoverned spaces, we're likely to face a serious threat of terrorism. That was an early warning. Did we take it seriously? We tried, but I don't think we tried well enough and see where we are today. Libya, the world was warned. African Union tried to warn the world, the global community, about uh, focusing on um, regime change within a context or an ostensible responsibility to protect a format. And our African leaders tried to warn the world, particularly amid the global players, that please, this can have very serious repercussions and there are other ways of going about it. We didn't listen, and today that entire Sahelian region is destabilized, and it is moving from the Sahelian region through the central down to um, uh, southern Africa, Mozambique, northern Mozambique. Early warning requires early response, and it requires a concerted action, coordinated, not narrow interest or comfort zone for some. I'm moving forward. So I don't want to dwell too much on the um, uh, landscape because I believe you and I are already aware. I mean, it is better to go straight into the questions that you have posed that you expect us to answer. And the first one is, in the face of all of this, what is the AU doing? Hmm. Secondly, if the AU is doing something, we said uh, uh, initially that Agenda 2020, we shall silence the guns. 
There has been a slippage. We are now looking at 2030. If that is the case, can we really silence the guns? That's the second question. And the third question is then to look forward. If we are to silence the guns, what would be the factors of success that would drive us to either silence the guns by 2030, which I doubt, or within a certain period, because our horizon for Africa in terms of visioning is 2063, where we expect that the Africa that you are dreaming of for yourselves and for generations to come will be achieved by 2063. And um, in between aligning with the uh, UN Agenda 2030 of this uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So let's uh, start with the first uh, question, which is what is the African Union doing? Basically, um, a number of uh, strategic and operational initiatives. At the strategic level is to create a legal framework that enables and drives action and policies on the, on the continent. And as you know, there is the uh, Assembly Declaration, the 50th Anniversary Declaration of the African Union that laid the foundation for uh, silencing the guns uh, initiatives. And uh, we also have um, 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 legal mechanisms um, uh, which speak to having a roadmap which is more operational and a monitoring and evaluation system which is also operational in order to drive the process um, forward. Uh, there are other legal mechanisms which is the Lome um, uh, Convention on Maritime Security for the entire African American continent, which is supposed to be in synergy with this. At the operational level, we are looking at conflict prevention that helps us to move effectively towards silencing the guns. One of the triggers of conflict, as you know, in our day to day is about governance and democracy through the vehicle of elections. And so what I'm the, uh, the focus here is how to effectively support our member states to manage the electoral process in such a manner that the processes are transparent, fair, inclusive, and peaceful to prevent further conflicts. We can lead into further arms proliferation and uh, more conflict and destabilization. There is also the African Amnesty Month, which um, uh, has been uh, declared to be celebrated every September. And uh, what, one of the things that the commission is trying to do uh, together with the department is to make sure that the celebration of this Amnesty Month is not just one of our usual uh, day celebrations that is of no impact, just having an event, no um, real context and no continuity and no impact and centralized at the African Union or the REC level, but that it is done at the national level and uh, ideally with local level of participation. So that is one of the trust in, in trying to make sure, and this is where conversations can play a very key role to, to bring this whole thing to the grassroots so that there is effective participation of the people in what our leaders go to decide on their behalf uh, moving um, forward. But uh, other things that are uh, un un uh, being undertaken by the African Union, as you recall, is the critical AU institutional reforms led by the president of Rwanda, President Kagame. As you know, he has the DNA um, to lead in such um, reforms. And uh, these reforms are being unpacked in the, our department, which originally was uh, in the form of two departments, Department of Political Affairs, Department of Peace and Security, under the reforms in order to make the AU more efficient and responsive to the challenges, to merge the two for um, uh, synergy and efficiency. And so one of the first things the commissioner has been doing since he assumed duty is to ensure that there's appropriate realignment of this newly merged department. And I can assure you it's not an easy exercise. The second thing I mean, he's trying to do is to ensure that in tune with the reforms that we have a management culture ch change within the department and hopefully 
his peers are doing the same I mean, moving forward. And that, again, I can assure you, it's not an easy task. I mean, having seen it at ECOWAS and uh, a bit of it at the UN, change um, uh, management, as you know, perhaps better than me, is one of the most difficult exercises that an entity, um, a state, or an institution can undertake. But you do it and do it well, and you are good to go. It's a discipline that we can imbibe, and I, it, our hope is that the young generation will uh, bring it forward. I will not go too much into details because there's an opportunity for us to have a Q&A, just to provoke okay. discussions. So let me move to your second question about, uh, is it doable? Okay. Uh Permit me, Ambassador, uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. We don't want you to so, uh, hear from uh, the other panelists. So thank you very oh, much uh, for your insightful briefing. And it's interesting to know that, you know, the African Union is not just holding their arms, they're doing something about this. Uh, I also share your optimism about a bright future um, for Africa in terms of uh, leveraging on uh, technology and the water view. Uh, so uh, I look forward to uh, getting back to you on uh, the other questions. Um, Ambassador, thank you so much once again for your insightful uh, keynote address. Now I want to move things along by inviting our panel uh, up onto the platform. Uh, let me just introduce them. We have uh, Dr. Oluwale Ojoale is the ENACT Regional Organized Crime Observatory Coordinator for Central Africa at the Institute of Security Studies in Ghana. Uh, introducing uh, Dr. Ulu Ojewali, uh, who is one of our panelists today. So, uh, Ojewali would be joined on.
view of um, the efforts of the African Union to silence the guns. It sounded um, positive in some respects, a bit uh, pessimistic in some respects as well. And one of the things I took away from him was where he said that um, he doubted if Africa can silence the guns by 20 years. From, from no, and maybe I should, um, uh, uh, Professor Ingris, you know, what do you think about um, um, tackle the insurgencies on the content, the target of a silencing the gun? Is the AU Yes, are you hearing me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for hosting me today, and I am uh, delighted to be here with you. And I'm also glad uh, about all the panelists who are with me here today. So let me start with this thing. And insurgents in Africa, we need to understand first and foremost the root cause of what creates insurgency in Africa more than any other continent in the world. Uh, th th that question needs to be answered by not just the scholars, intellectuals of uh, uh, African descent, but also ordinary Africans on the streets. We have to be, uh, uh, be pretty aware to ask them, how do they see political conflicts in Africa? How do they like to be resolved? We have a lot of elders on the, on the village, on the neighborhoods, not just the, the town, and urban areas, but as well as uh, the rural areas. We need to ask them uh, now what is happening in the post colonial, from the post colonial period in Africa, why political conflicts are so huge, so protracted, and so perpetual in Africa more than any other conflict. I think what we need in order to resolve these issues is first to uh, strive to understand uh, uh, the, the genealogies and the genesis of these insurgents, and second, and the most important of all, we have to agree on those root causes because you know, there are a lot of disagreements of what creates insurgency in Africa. I think the most important thing is for two things. One is a political power, and the second one is the lack of equitable resource sharing in Africa. Uh, we didn't have, and uh, we don't have in Africa, an, uh, an, uh, a, a constitution agreed, a social contract agreed by. And, uh, and Africans, uh, in order to share power, in order to dispense power, in order to and, uh, divide among resources that we and, uh, got from our soils, how can we share? How can we reach yeah, to the recipients? And uh, in, if you look at in the United States, if you look at Europe, when, uh, in their conflicts during their insurgence in the 15th century, in the 16th century before the Enlightenment, they have achieved, yeah to resettle those questions from the very beginning. We didn't have that time in, in the post-colonial period as well, especially in the, during the decolonization. Many questions, our main, as Africans, our main priority was to kick colonialism out of Africa. And we didn't talk at the time, the forefathers of African independence, they didn't have the time yeah, to resolve uh, the real issues that confronted Africa in the post-colonial period, especially in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, as well as in the 90s, during the end of the Cold War. So there are, uh, in this 21st century, there are a lot of critical um, questions that need to be answered carefully in order to get or to resolve these insurgents that come in from East Africa or Horn of Africa up to the West Africa. Sometimes in West Africa, we see in North Africa and the Central Africa, everywhere in Africa. Yeah, I think we need to come together. And, 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 and I would suggest the African Union um, to organize a kind of a, a big conference, either in Addis Ababa or Dakar or in Johannesburg or in Nairobi, assemblies in Africa, in order to find the organic ideas coming from Africans to resolve these issues of insurgents coming up everywhere. And we need to prefer political settlements everywhere rather than armed uh, resolution in order to wage war everywhere. Because we have been in war and we have been following our blood and uh, since the 1960s, uh, sure and nothing sure. can come Anyone out. Can stay. Are, you me? Me? Uh, uh, are you hearing me? Uh, we can hear you, Dr. English. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Are you done with your uh, first submission? Are you hearing me? Or sometimes yes. I don't hear. Uh, okay. Dr. Ingris, we can hear yes. you loud and clear. Just to yes. confirm if you're done answering the first uh, question, are you done with your submission, sir? The, yes. What, what was it? Can you repeat it again? No, I said, uh, have you concluded your answer to the first question? So yes, yes, I can yes, move I have on concluded to the next it. That's panel. fine. Yes, yes. I may be a bit Thank long, you very much. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ingris. Now, I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Uh, Ojewale into the conversation. Now, Dr. Ojewale, as the ENACT Regional Organized Crime Observatory Coordinator, you have ex extensive experience in studying organized uh, crime, transnational organized crime. You've traveled extensively across this continent. Uh, how does organized crime intersect with insurgencies in Africa? And how can countering uh, organized crime contribute to peace and stability on the continent? Thank you so much, uh, Benga. Um, I think I love this question for obvious reason. And the title of this conference centers on silence in the gun. Um, I will come from the angle of organized crime to say, whether it is terrorism, whether it is insurgency of violent extremism, the oxygen of terror of insurgency is access to arms. Violent extremist group, terrorist group can go ahead to recruit people to radicalize them if they do not have access to guns, if they know, do not have access to the AK-47, the Kalashnikov, the, 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 the bullets. There is really little to which they can do in causing violent havoc in communities where they are carrying out attacks. So this leads me in the direction of the overarching agenda that the AU has been pushing. And I'm very, very happy to listen to the ambassador in terms of what they are doing. So when you look at what is happening in West Africa, whether it is in um, Nigeria or Mali or Burkina Faso, or what is happening in the Horn of Africa, the major challenge in terms of the drivers and the enablers of transnational, I mean, of insurgency in the continent, on the continent is access to arms that have been trafficked. And a lot of explanation have been given. You heard the ambassador talking about the fall of uh, Libya, um, the removal of Gaddafi, and how that is causing arms to percolate into different parts of Africa. So one, that is the arms trafficking. The second thing is the fact that um, Organized crime is also serving as a conduit pipe for terrorism financing. So you see armed group, terrorist group, insurgent going into gold mining, going into diamond mining, going into illegal logging of timbers. These armed groups cannot really thrive. The terrorist group, the insurgent cannot, the insurgent cannot really thrive if they don't collect collaborate with organized criminals. And in most instances, we have also seen them directly getting involved in arms, I mean, in organized crime themselves to be able to enhance their terrorism financing. So these are the critical intersection of uh, insurgency with transnational organized crime on the continent. And the major factor that is causing this to bloom is the border porosity in most places in Africa. Um, you can almost move from Mauritania to, to Chad, moving arms and go scot-free without being discovered. Because for instance, you look at the border with Nigeria and Niger, this is about 1,500 kilometer, kilometers, having less than legal border route of 50 posts, manned by custom, manned by immigration, and a few multinational joint tax forces here and there. So you find out that because of the historical ties that these communities have to, I mean, with each other as over 100 years ago, before the balkanization of modern African states, there are outlets through which people move from one place to the other. And these are the places that the insurgent group, the terrorist group, are also moving their arms across the border. So we have to address the issue of border porosity across the continent. That is a major factor. And the second thing that is also very, very important is that most of the times we talk about the regional agencies, 
And I'm talking about the power of the African agency in this. We can talk about the African Union, talk about the ECA, talk about headquarters. Most of the times, the heads of state who form the bodies, these regional bodies, go into their different countries to do the, something different from what the protocols of these organizations actually um, suggest that they should be doing in terms of arms traffic, I mean, in terms of combating insecurity on the continent. So to the extent to which we don't have this multinational engagement, apart from paperwork, protocols being development, real implementation is always lacking in most instances. And it borders on issues of funding, which must also be I mean, elevated in this conversation. So when you look at all these factors put together, the border porosity, the inability of the state to actually comply with what they agree to do, and then you look at how organized crime is actually providing oxygen for insurgency, we find ourselves at this crossroad that we have to continue to deal with insurgency. And like the ambassador said that they are looking at 2030. The original agenda was 2020. Now we're looking at 2030. But the overarching objective is looking at the overall Agenda of Agenda 2063 of the HAYU. I am not sure because uh, if we can wait to that time before we actually find a lasting solution to these challenges. So we put it back to where we started to say we need to really expedite action. And let me quickly say that if Africa will not do the need for now, the armed groups, the insurgents, the terrorist groups that are relocating from different parts of the world, whether in the Middle East, in Syria, in Lebanon, and all these places, they are suddenly found a safe haven in Africa. A pivotal place has, I mean, been identified, and that is the Sahel region, and some part of the Horn of Africa and East Africa as a whole. So rather than allowing them to first start their nest in our region, it implies that at the continental level, at the regional level, at the governmental level, we really need to prioritize the security of lives and property in this region and not allow the terrorists, the insurgents to actually create a safe even, whether in our corridor or even in the hinterland of Africa. This is where we find ourselves. 2063 is too far. Uh, we really need to look for quick solutions. I don't want to go about the issues um, that are driving it, which earlier speakers have mentioned, yeah. but on the final analysis, these are critical areas that we really need to tackle issues of insurgency if we really want an Africa that is prosperous and safe for her to live. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ojewale, for your submission. Ambassador, uh, you did talk about uh, Ambassador Ibn Chambers back then. He saw uh, the future. It was very prophetic about these vast ungoverned spaces. Uh, Dr. Ojewale just raised another issue that, you know, 26 degrees too far. If we don't do something about this, uh, we might end up as an Afghanistan 2.0, having uh, terrorism central, you know, a safe haven for uh, terrorists all over the world. So talking about doing something uh, uh, to silence the guns, you did mention uh, some of the steps the African Union is taking. Now, Ambassador, the silencing the guns initiative, uh, like we've said, the deadline has been extended to 2030, you're not optimistic uh, we might reach uh, that goal. What fundamental shifts or adaptations are needed to achieve this ambitious goal? And how can the African Union engage member states more effectively in this effort? Uh, Dr. Adewale talked about, you know, when they meet at regional level or at the continental level, some of those heads of state just go back to business as usual. How can the African Union engage states more effectively and how do they uh, assess uh, progress? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yinka. A very, I like the way, as my preceding speaker also said, the way you have couched the uh, question, what fundamental shifts must we make? Uh, it's about change. You remember in Nigeria, you had this saying, change begins with me, you recall? It's very yes. relevant here. And I'm referencing it for very good reason. Very often the narrative that we have is, oh, what will the government do for us to address this problem? And that's at the national level. Regional, what will ECOWAS do? Continental, what will AU do? I, I, and I say, the state is as good as we are. 
ECOWAS, SADC, East African Community, uh, North Africa, Central Africa, ECAS, um, uh, IGAD, others are as good as our member states are and we, the non-state actors, are. So uh, uh, while trying to answer your question, the first fundamental shift, in my view, should come from citizens, national citizens, regional citizens, and continental citizens, and organized entities like this platform of conversations. A shift to appreciate that that change, we have a critical role to play, and we cannot afford to leave it to public servants and politicians. That is extremely risky, and change cannot happen just by them alone. We must see ourselves as part of that to hold them to account, not just politicians, but also public servants at the local level, at the national level, at the regional level, and at the continental level, to hold public servants to account as much as we want to hold politicians to account. Decisions are taken at the regional level, coming from member state level, at the member state level, there should have been some coordination between state institutions and non-state institutions before the member state goes to an organization like ECOWAS or SADC to go and be representing your interests. And if that does not happen, if I, I am in charge of ECOWAS in Ghana and I'm going and I don't do that, am I going to speak on my personal views or on the views of I'm in Ghana? and other countries. This is what has been happening. I, when I watch meetings in ECOWAS, you see a member state official say, my country will not agree to this. Zero. There were no prior consultations in his or her country. The person just yes, expressing his own views. Fundamental shift for non-state actors. Two, in terms of uh, uh, our, what do you call it, reforms, you notice that at our member states level, regional and continental, we do reforms. These reforms themselves need management because very often we resist change. So that is another critical area, how to manage institutional reforms for them to be consistent, sustainable, and impactful. And not today to move two steps forward, then tomorrow you move three steps backwards, either because of change, of leadership, or because people are not very keen. That is also a very a key one. And then how do you unpack leadership? Leadership should not be seen as people on top. Leadership is either from the front, from the side, or from the back. So we must unpack leadership. Conversations is providing leadership, not from the front, but from the side. Just like you have in the concept of multi-level governance, which is coming from the European Union, I mean, intellectual input multi-level governance, which is vertical and horizontal, um, and where non-state actors have a critical role at the horizontal level to play a key role along with the state and um, the party. So we need to unpack leadership. The next one, um, Yinka, is concepts. Bengals, uh, apologies. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Benga, sorry about that. Uh, yes. Uh, concepts. We, the African intellectuals and public servants, we are borrowing geopolitical contraptions from outside, which are either divisive in the African continent or counterproductive. And I'll give you a few examples. Africa south of the Sahara, sub-Saharan Africa. That is not AU language. In the African Union, there's nothing like that. You have regions, north, south, east, west, center. But because some other entities outside of our continent, for their own convenience, have arranged it so, we are also doing it. And we are reinforcing divisions. The Sahara is not a dividing factor to Africa. And our young people are showing it. They use it to go to Europe. In the olden days, trans-Saharan trade. Our people were trading, crossing the Sahara to the Middle East. That has never been a divisive factor. So my appeal, Benga, is to uh, our intellectuals and uh, public servants. Let's change that language. And my commissioner is very passionate about this. And also the media too. Uh, uh, I think the media also needs to stop using that language. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Then um, what do you call it? The, the, the sense of belonging then comes into play. 
when the, uh, Mali was going through its problems, I recall telling some uh, Ghanaians that that pressure Mali was feeling. As Ghanaians, I don't think uh, many Ghanaians felt they were part of that pressure. That sense of belonging, when you say African Union, is it on paper or is it in reality? When I'm sitting in a meeting as an, a Ghanaian ambassador and the president of uh, Nigeria, of Kenya, or South Africa is speaking, do I see him as my president too? I, uh, usually people don't feel it that way. And you call it a union? We, that is where my pessimism is coming from. And so conversations, I mean, uh, the work you are doing along with others, forming synergies with other similar bodies, like Wademos in West Africa, WANEP, CDD, Nigeria, Ghana, and others. You can help to create that momentum for our people. When we are in the diaspora, you can see the sense of belonging that we have. But when we come home, somehow, I mean, something happens. And we are back I mean, to one. So those, uh, that's another fundamental shift that we must have. The last fundamental shift I want to mention because of time, is what the commissioner is trying to do, okay? To bring uh, the uh, think tanks and CSO communities in Africa to share a common platform and accompany the state side, that is national, rec, and continental, for us to do justice to that which we must do and not to leave it to just um, the state. Um, and uh, the, again, um, um, co uh, conversations, you have a very critical role to play in helping us to build that uh, momentum. Uh, I don't know whether you have heard that uh, there's this uh, initiative called Network for African Think Tanks, which the commissioner um, initiated, and it was brought into by the AU Peace and Security Council after the chairperson, and it was launched by the deputy chairperson uh, um, just before the uh, uh, February uh, summit in Abuja um, uh, this uh, earlier, I mean, uh, this year. So um, I have been too long, so let me pause here so that please uh, my others can also uh, have a go at it. Thank you for that. Very Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for your brilliant insights. Uh, now, back to you, Dr. Ingris. Uh, Dr. Ingris, uh, Somalia is one country where the African Union uh, is looking to sign as the guns. Uh, there is an active uh, conflict there between the central government Mogadishu and al Shabaab, which has been uh, going on for many years now. Uh, upon assumption of uh, his presidency, uh, the president, the new president, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, uh, said, you know, dealing with al Shabaab uh, will be one of his topmost priorities. Now, Dr. Ingris, as a recognized authority on Somali conflict, uh, what insights can you offer? Uh, on the role of cultural and social factors in peace building efforts in Somalia. Because I believe about now uh, there's an ongoing offensive against uh, Al Shabaab militants in central uh, Somalia, and it involves uh, some of these uh, clans and elders. How, how can these insights, uh, this uh, social cultural factors in peace building efforts, how can these insights be applied? Uh, to other African contexts. Hello, Dr. Ingris, are you there? Yes, are you hearing me or are you not? Yes, go, go okay, ahead. That's, okay, that's fine, thank you. I think the most important thing is to uh, analyze or assess the Somali political conflict from the perspective of anthropological uh, aspect, I think. And uh, there is a, a culture uh, that we share, a lot of African communities like South Sudanese and others that prefers or is based on a political culture which, which draws from a zero sum game and a, a kind of a winner takes all. So that is what, uh, one crucial main reason why the Somali political conflict has become so protracted and so perpetual for a long time. So the roots of the Somali political conflicts date back in the 1970s, and when there emerged an uh, armed opposition and uh, rebel groups in nearby Ethiopia, and uh, vying for 
of a throw of the Somali military regime at the time. And, and the conflict ha since then had a lot of shapes and forms. At one time, it was a kind of a, a, between a government and rebel groups. And another was after the collapse of the Somali state in the 1990s, Islamic before the Islamic courts was a fictional leader trying to capture the uh, state and uh, its resources. And later on, a conflict between clans as well. So we have a period of uh, no peace, no war from 1991 up to 2000 when Somalis were gathered in Arta, a town in Djibouti, and um, formed a kind of a transitional government. And later on, there was the emergence of Islamists. And the Somalis were and, um, influenced and shaped by what was happening in Afghanistan and in Iraq and everywhere. And you understand Somalia is a kind of a window from Africa to the Arabia and to Asia as well. Uh, historically, where the Arabs came and uh, Asians came uh, into Africa, well, mainly well, one of the main uh, routes were, were in Somalia. So when the Islamists came to power, they overall, or commonly or generally, and uh, changed the political landscape in Somalia. So you have an al-Shabaab and insurgents at the moment striving to overthrow the and, uh, uh, and, uh, the government in Mogadishu, not just this one, but the success, successive governments over the last 16 years. And uh, when Al Shabaab started the war and against and, um, and, uh, the Somali government in 2007, so we have now 16 years of fighting going on between Shabaab and the government on the one side and Shabaab and Amazon forces, African Union. So we, we, we need two things. First, we have to have a deep understanding of Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab is framed by how the United States frames them, which is a terrorist organization. So you, you, you cannot negotiate with terrorists yeah, from the perspective of the United States and the West. So we need that kind of a mindset. We have to think as an Africans. Yeah? This is our own problem at the, at the end of the day. So we have to think Al-Shabaab as an insurgents group trying to hold the power through by force whatever ideology they have, whether religion, whether they have a nationalistic religion, like the decolonization era, and, uh, and uh, the group is like led by Nakroma, Patrice Lamomba, which was basically nationalistic. And mm -hmm. you have now a religious base, whatever ideology that allows them to reach to the corridors of power, state power. So and, uh, if we look at how we can build peace, I think we need to build from the below. We have to start a peace building in all of Africa, wherever insurgents are there, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, everywhere in Mozambique, where there are a lot of other yeah, Islamic insurgents. You need to start community level peace building mechanism, not from the top. Yeah? You can make a parallel, yeah? either on the top or on the bottom, whichever works, you have to test. There is not that kind of test at the moment in Somalia. So and, uh, you can involve the Kalan elders, you can involve women groups, you can involve youth groups, you can involve intellectuals, you can involve every sector of society. You have to be broad-based peace building reconciliation efforts. So what I would suggest is to try political settlement with the Al-Shabaab insurgents. You have been fighting for 16 years and African Union forces were there. And now they are saying they are leaving next year, December. What is going to happen? That is a question asked by Somali elites as well as the ordinary. After the Amazon, what will happen? Uh, after the Af African Union forces leave us on, this, on the political scene of Somalia. So, yeah. So that kind of yeah, questions yeah. are still being uh, needs to be critically answered. That very uh, important and poignant question, uh, Dr. Ingris, because uh, as the Somali National Army builds enough capacity uh, to take over from Amazon, will they leave a vacuum uh, which Al Shabaab uh, might take advantage of uh, following the departure of Amazon troops in uh, in Somalia? Uh, questions that are begging for answers. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ingris. Now, back to you, Dr. Uh, Jewale. Insurgencies, as we know, uh, often thrive in areas with weak governance. Uh, could you delve into? Uh, specific governance issues such as corruption, effective service delivery that contributes to the growth of insurgencies, and what reforms are needed to address uh, these challenges effectively. Thank you. 
Yes, um, governance deficit is a major challenge in most places in Africa. And governance, not necessarily in the sense that uh, people do not have political representative. It is the fact that uh, those representative across board, um, they do not deliver things that can improve the quality of lives of the people at a required scale, particularly considering our present realities. So I'm going to give you an instance about, uh, for instance, you look at places like Nigeria, where a lot of uh, children are out of school, um, a lot of girls are out of school, and then you also look at um, the means of livelihood in those places. Do they have a thriving economy? Has government actually provided uh, basic infrastructure to facilitate or reflect local economies in those places? And in the instance that those things are completely missing, then you turn to the last factor, which is very, very important. And here we're talking about security architecture. Essentially, the state, the face of state authority anywhere when people talk about ungoverned spaces, the first thing they are talking about is who is representing government in this place. And the number one face that you talk to is the police. So we're talking about stronger police response that can serve as a deterrence for people to engage in any form of criminality. So what you find in all these places, whether from the stretch of Northern Nigeria, as far as Mauritania, as far as Niger, Mali, and all these places in Africa, is that in instances where infrastructure is lacking, in instances where people do not have access to basic education, at least uh, maybe a, a ninth grade to speak in this regard, in instances where hospitals are not available, in instances where people cannot even live on one dollar per day, then the last thing that is supposed to serve as a regulatory mechanism is also missing. Missing because one, insurgent terrorist group have become much more sophisticated than basic policing house outposts that you can find in these places. So what we have seen in most places is that rather than the police holding the ground, they are rather retreating to the cities and then moving away from these places. And the more they police presence cannot be felt in these places. It creates a vacuum that this terrorist group, this insurgent group can quickly fill. Uh, and that is what has become the experiences when we talk about governance deficit in these places. It can be felt at this at least three, four layers that I've mentioned earlier. Now, when this is not happening, you also now overlay this with arms trafficking, border porosity that I raised earlier. And then insurgent group are recruiting people for as low as uh, 5,000 Naira, for instance, in Nigeria. And that should be maybe less than $10, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it tells the extent to which poverty has become uh, ingrained in those communities that makes the youth to become easily vulnerable to recruitment in those places. So this governance deficit is what we're talking about that the government needs to address. So it's not necessarily about inclusion that people do not have representative. It is that their representative are not representing their interests mm -hmm. where it matters. And what you find is that you find politicians who are elected from these places who don't go to those places for a whole year, for a whole legislative session. They reside in Abuja, they reside in Bamako. I was carrying out a research in Bamako and I was speaking with senior officials. And we digress and I asked that, uh, of course, multi region is a volatile region, it's from the multi region. And we asked basically, like, uh, so how frequent do you go to multi region? He said, I can't go. That place is inaccessible. If I go, they are probably going to kidnap me. So if you have instances where somebody has been elected to represent, Present people at the cap. I mean, the capital Bamako, and he can't go to those places. How is he going to be aware? How is he going to feel what they feel in those places? So you have a situation whereby governance deficit most of the time is as a result of the disconnection of the people that are supposed to be representing and presenting the affairs of their people and causing good governance that will improve the quality of life of the people in those places. It is in the instances that this is very, very low, or is minimally fed or not fed at all, that the insurgents are actually now latching on and expanding their territory to the point that in the recent time, Bamako was in cycle, Wagadugu was in cycle. You saw in Abuja how up less than maybe six, Millage drive from Puje prison to Hasso Rock. 
the terrorist group struck in the heartland of Abuja. And then when you look at all this case, you realize that uh, it's either the people that are elected representative are living in a I different world on the world that the people are living in, or there is no really concerted commitment to deliver um, the basic objective of, of governance, which is the protection of life and properties of the people and the welfare of the people. So we should be moving in the direction of what should be the solution. For me, a, a critical area that we need to address is investment in education, quality investment in education that takes people to at least ninth grade, quality investment in health, in infrastructure. And Africa largely is an agrarian economy. To come out of this rabbit hole now, I think there's a need for a continental agenda. They have, we've had that before, Lagos, 1980s, and all those declarations all over the places, is that Af Africa is an agrarian society. Government must make concerted effort to bring back agriculture. This is going to take a lot of youth away from susceptibility of vulnerability to be re recruited into violent extremism group. And I think it's a quick win because there is really no nothing that we need that we cannot provide here. What we just need yeah. is to provide- And also food security too. Yes, because this is linked to what we're talking about. When people are not hungry, uh, when people can feed themselves, they are not likely going to be recruited into armed groups as well. So we need to tie all these things together. The first quick win is that there is a need for concerted investment in these areas that I've mentioned. It is at that level that people can begin to feel the impact of government and then the kinetic operation, the area bombardment of whatever government wants to do in terms of security response can come as a complementary effort. But by and large, what we have seen over the years is that for obvious reasons, maybe for defense corruption, we have seen states prioritizing kinetic operation above soft approach to country yeah. insurgents in their coin operations on the continent. So there's a need to retweak that paradigm to favor the soft approach uh, while we also pay attention to the kinetic approach. And like I said, you know, defense provides a veritable grant for defense corruption. And it is as people continue to elevate this in their annual budget that a lot of people continue to feed fat on the budget Why not really addressing the issue. I would rather advocate that we yeah. build a budget in around things that actually address this deficit and not, um, um, it has never worked anywhere. There, the was insurgency in more, there was insurgency in Sri Lanka for more than 50 years. So you can, there is nowhere kinetic operation alone has solved insurgency across the world. And I don't think Africa is going to be different. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marshall, the Nigeria, uh, for defense, you know, defense contracts and all of that, just to speak to your point. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you're just joining, this is the Conversation uh, Dialogue series. We're discussing insurgency in Africa, uh, silence in the guns. Uh, we do appreciate everyone that is on the platform, and we would like to keep things interactive. Uh, so we've been getting your questions in the Q&A box. So I would like to take a few uh, questions from the members of the audience. Uh, now, back to you, Ambassador. Uh, still talking about silence in the Bronx. We have a question here. Sudan just reached the six month milestone of the conflict. It's led to over 8,000 people dead. Uh, the question here is uh, Ambassador, it's a million dollar question. Who's going to silence the guns in Sudan? Who would impose uh, an embargo on arms and armaments uh, from individuals and groups at uh, these belligerents who are fostering uh, this conflict because it's just innocent people caught in the crosshairs. It's a personal fight between Mohammed and Ben Dagu, uh, and General Abdel Fattah El Bohan. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, the questioner is posing a very pertinent but extremely difficult question, because that is a huge challenge facing our continent and uh, the leadership of the African Union, as you know. The Sudan problem is not just an African problem. It has 
very serious international dimensions to the point where addressing it I mean, is slipping out of the hands of our African leadership, painfully so. And with the support of the United Nations, there are ongoing efforts to make sure that addressing Sudan is done by Africans in support of Sudan in the spirit of African problems, African solutions, which does not preclude support from the international community, but that in the driving seat must be African uh, players and not external players. I hope you are aware some partners have tried to assist for various reasons, and the current focus has shifted from an incontinent I mean, a mediation to an extracontinental mediation at which table the I mean, African Union has fought to come back into. I mean, and uh, why it should happen that way, I, mean, uh, I, I really do not understand. But was, uh, this is not a time for rivalry and for credit gaining. People are dying. And you will notice that in terms of conflicts, when you do not take control of it, I mean, uh, external partners may come in with goodwill, but with an approach that is different from what we have and at the expense of uh, people. But, uh, if you look at the Ethiopian problem in, in the North, the Tigrayan conflict. Yes. What happened? The Ethiopian government decided that this is an Ethiopian problem, an African problem between African brethren, and they were going to resolve it the African way among Ethiopians. And they did. And they did. President Obasanjo was um, uh, the mediator appointed by the African Union. The meeting which took place that um, uh, a UN uh, senior official described as the miracle peace deal um, was uh, uh, driven by the Ethiopians themselves. And let me tell you something interesting. When the meeting took place, I had the privilege of accompanying my commissioner and the chairperson of the AU to that um, epoch-making peace agreement in Pretoria, South Africa. Pretoria provided the appropriate moral support and logistical support. The Ethiopians themselves announced to the AU and uh, observers from the UN and the US that this issue, we are going to tackle it as brethren. We are going to speak our own language. When we need you, you are around, we will call you in. And that is exactly what happened. And beyond our expectations, within 10 days, I mean, they had come to an agreement, a miracle agreement, one of the fastest mm -hmm. ever you can get. And can you imagine that since they signed that agreement, I mean, uh, up to date, not a single gunshot has been fired in that area. Just imagine that. Why am I saying this? Uh, Sudan, the national stakeholders of Sudan must also take ownership of the process. And one of the gaps is that the civil actors are regrettably not united in their front and allowing too much space to the military actors to occupy the space and pursue whatever um, interest that they may be having. Sorry, permit me to interrupt you here, Ambassador. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. will disagree with you. There's a very active uh, civil society presence and they were protesting uh, before this ah. war, uh, <laughs> almost on a daily basis. So they will disagree with you that they allowed I mean, these guys have the guns and they're just civilians. So how much? Yeah. Uh, what, what yeah, very, very, you know, very important point. What I was saying is not civil society, uh, civil society organizations. I'm talking about non-military actors, which includes the political parties. In fact, more than civil society organizations. When the political parties who should converge in order to counter the power of the military are not united, then you don't expect traction. And just to let you know, this is, has been one of the priorities of the African Union. And as we speak now, the efforts are focused under the, uh, the Peace and Security Council direction to bring these civil actors together for them to get to a certain amount of consensus which can provide the necessary traction 
for the processes to continue. And this is currently ongoing. That is where I was coming from. So I hope you get the point I was making. Good. So it's not about suicide. Yes, yes, I do. It's about mainly yes. the political parties. I mean, of course, um, with some civil society organizations who are also divided mm -hmm. in support of this or that political party. And you see it played in a lesser way in other countries, which slows down the processes in um, those um, countries. So Sudan, now as we speak, there are, there are two main challenges. How to make sure that AU takes ownership and together with IGAD drives the mediation process in support of our Sudanese um, stakeholders and how to so create a platform which is ongoing for the civil actors, that's political parties and organized uh, CSOs to meet, come to a certain amount of convergence, be able to designate certain delegates who can in a smaller group then meet to move the process forward in order to get the generals to also play ball. So that is the current thrust of moving forward. It's not going to be an easy one. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your submission. Uh, Dr. Ingris, we have a question from you, from the members of the, from a member of the audience. Uh, is He or she says, how do you propose we get better at dealing with the gaps between proposed interventions and political will? Uh, I guess, in essence, is saying that beyond conferences and uh, meeting at the AU and regional bodies, how do we, where, where will the political will come from to enforce uh, agreements and, you know, so that we don't end up having this uh, conferences and meetings as just ordinary talk shops uh, while the people suffer, uh, while the people on the ground suffer? I think, and um, thank you very much. I would suggest African Union, uh, now, for example, in Somalia, where there is a currently a precarious situation, if I'm Somali, is next year, at the end of next year, I think the EU needs to take the lead before it leaves, uh, before it draws or pulls out its force from Somalia to convene or organize a dialogue session for the Somali government and the uh, Al Shabaab insurgents uh, to talk somewhere in Africa instead of uh, a kind of a negotiation between the United States and uh, what happened in Afghanistan in Qatar. I would not, I would not say and, uh, hold this conference in outside Africa, but somewhere in Africa before they leave to have a, a kind of a negotiation between the uh, insurgents in Ethiopia, as the ambassador pointed out, that went to South Africa between the Ethiopian government and the, the northern insurgency of Tigray, although they were based on ethnic basis at the, uh, in, in Ethiopia, and uh, those who were trying to recapture power from the north of Ethiopia and to come to Ethiopia by force and overthrow the, the, uh, the regime of Abiy Ahmed uh, two years ago, uh, that kind of mediation could happen in Somalia. I think uh, at the end of the day, and, uh, I would think that something positive can come out if the EU changes the mindset that they see insurgency in Africa through the mindset of the West or international donors who, who, who base yeah, largely uh, uh, the funding of the Amazon forces in Somalia. So with, and, uh, with outgoing conferences, what we need is to take out also in a parallel level, this kind of a strategy for awareness, for community awareness, yeah? for the peace, reconciliation, yeah, and nation building. Uh, we have seen all of us uh, what the United States at admitted. What level, Doctor Ingris? This awareness should be at what level? A uh, community level, as I pointed out, the bottom-up approach. Yeah, yeah? and uh, one of my colleagues has pointed out that uh, Africa needs an uh, organic-based indigenous ed education about their culture of peace uh, during the pre-colonial period, how they lived and uh, harmony harmonious and uh, building a kind of a cohesive society yeah you cannot start on the top and come down so and uh, there are a lot of ideas that we could resolve uh, one by one uh, critical issues affecting african societies th through this emerging and uh, growing emergence and insurgence yeah m m many places in africa mm -hmm. and uh, mainly in horn of africa and west africa or central africa so what I would suggest is an uh, African Union, since they are the main uh, uh, in political institution representing Africa, 
to take the lead, not to run away from the from a conflict generated by the so-called war on terror and uh, 20 years back in Africa. Yeah, we, we have to have some solution before things uh, being messed up and uh, more than each other. Yeah? yeah, that's my idea. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ingris. Uh, now, Dr. Jawali, we have a question here, but I'll paraphrase um, from a member of the audience. It says Africa has too many, uh, many different partners for security. Uh, France, the US, Russia, uh, who should they trust and who should they avoid? So let me just uh, paraphrase. We've seen a proliferation of coups in recent times, and especially in the, uh, in the West Africa region, or where we are, uh, where you're very active. Uh, and once this new government's coming, the, the military government, one of the, it's almost the same playbook. It's, you know, we're dealing with the security situation and uh, we've seen a lot of this uh, government change these security agreements that they had uh, with France. I'm talking about West Africa and then they choose uh, other partners. Uh, the obvious one now is uh, Russia. So in answering this uh, individual's question, how do we decide who we want to uh, partner with for security? And uh, <laughs> the question is, who do you trust and who should you avoid? Well, I think the first thing is that uh, in international relation, the strategic objective of each country uh, is paramount. So the, the obvious uh, answer to this is to say, African countries should first prioritize their national interests. And, and I, I wouldn't say what is going on in the world now is um, what I consider to be ideological contestation that is also turning Africa to bar to ground. So you have the West versus Russia, the West versus um, the the Chinese, the, the, the Chinese Russia alliance uh, that is also mm -hmm. trying to come up. Um, to probably challenge the West. And then Africa has suddenly turned to a battleground. So for me, what we need to first prioritize is what is the national interest, what is going to benefit the people. And in the context of what we are talking about here, we're talking about harms, access to harm, even by the regular state actors. So I, I'm going to give you an example. There was a time that Nigeria wanted to prosecute and their counterinsurgency operation. And as at that time, they were requesting to import some arms from the United States of America. And the America basically told them that uh, you can't use these particular arms against your people, which is violating their human rights. You know, human rights is also part mm -hmm. of it. Nigeria had to turn around to go to other country to go and secure um, um, some arms that probably have uh, some equivalent potential of uh, power to be able to drive their military objective as far as counterinsurgency is concerned in the Northeast today. Uh, it does not necessarily have to turn Nigeria to anti-West or turn uh, Nigeria to maybe pro-Russia in this regard. Uh, what we have not seen is that uh, we've not seen the role, the capacity of the African agency to be able to actually address their own internal contradictions. And I think um, since we are having eminent persons like the ambassador on this platform and other policymakers that are probably joining that um, are also going to maybe watch this film later, um, this video later. What is very, very critical now is that we are at a time that the world is, um, the, the, the so-called countries that um, African countries gravitate to, they are presently dealing with with their own contradictions. So if there are African countries that have overtly rely, mm. relied on Russia for the supply of arms for their counterinsurgency operation, you see Putin himself scavenging for arms in North Korea, in Iran recently. So there's little to which he can do in supporting them. America is caught up in the war with uh, Russia, where Ukraine, and at the same time, that has now gone under the radar with Israel war with Hamas now. What, uh, where does that leave Africa? So the role of the African agency in promoting technology, in promoting education, that is actually going to power our whole civilization as well to be able to deal with our internal contradiction. I think that is what we should focus on. But for me as a suggestion, 
we shouldn't be caught up in this second wave of Cold War between that is creating ideological divide. Um, becoming a friend of Russia must not necessarily turn you to the enemy of China or turn China uh, be a friend of China turning you to the enemy of the West because these things actually have subterranean implications. And um, I think African countries essentially must be able to develop the courage and the strength to manage what uh, I call two-table diplomacy. So you are dealing with this, you are also dealing with that, and it does not fracture your national interest in any way. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ojoale. Uh, Ambassador, I would like you to, I'd like us to follow this same thing uh, on who, how do we choose our friends and our strategic partners. A few things have happened in the last uh, one year, uh, which I'll speak to. Dr. Ojoale mentioned uh, the Leahy's Law. Uh, this is the United States uh, law that prohibits the uh, providing training and equipment to foreign forces that commit human rights abuses. If you look at uh, the situation in Gaza as we speak, uh, the United States is actively uh, supplying arms to Israel, and Israel is using this arms to commit uh, gross human rights. But that's an aside, and it was based on this law that the United States refused to sell arms to Nigeria a few years ago. Now, something interesting happened in the United Nations uh, General Assembly vote last year on the Ukraine uh, issue after Russia invaded. Uh, the ambassador of the United States to the United Nations, Ambassador Linda Thomas Grenfell, said that those African countries that abstained uh, from you know, condemning Russia in the UN General Assembly vote uh, meant tacit support for Russia. Uh, is she suggesting that African countries don't have the agency uh, to make the decisions? And how do we, um, how does Africa move forward from its over reliance on you know, international uh, partners for its security and uh, national security interests, basically? Yeah, today I'm hearing only very um, exciting and pertinent I mean, questions. I mean, uh, this is a, another very critical area, and uh, Dr. Odewale has already set the tone. I recall um, Nkrumah at uh, Independence was saying, we neither look east nor west. Everybody is our friend. Everybody is our partner. And this is driven by the African spirit or philosophy of Ubuntu. I am because you are under the aegis of the God Almighty. And it's also a reminder that Africa has a critical role to play in global politics and in promoting a common humanity. Never mind the centuries of um, battering by certain people of our continent. The first world, as far as uh, some of us can see, is Africa. Africa is not a third world continent. Africa is the first world. And we need to change that narrative, which I, have, I was mentioning earlier, and that should come from uh, intellectuals and writers. In this specific case, I mean, and the relevance of it is that the AU itself is at a a juncture where it wants to review its partnerships. And you recall the president of Kenya speaking to that issue about the nature of AU strategic partnerships, where we are dealing with one country, a whole continent, and all our leaders go to meet with one leader. He, I mean, he said, and he was echoing what his peers I mean, are also thinking, that no, we must be more strategic I mean, than that. Related to that is that um, uh, if we are not, one of the things you notice is that there are certain very divisive issues in global politics. Uh, issues of LGBTQ, Russia-Ukraine war. Now you have uh, Palestine, I mean Israel. If you do not have a clear strategic focus, what will happen is that those issues are then used to further divide this continent of ours, which is on a much to rediscovering its unity in diversity. So we need a proper strategic focus. And that is where, again, I mean, 
uh, your platform, along with other non-state actor platforms, are going to be very critical moving forward. One of the things I tell our fellow African citizens is that sometimes we are too hard on our political leaders. When a political leader runs, how sure are we that he or she, when they turn their to look back, that we are there behind them? Because there are hawks out there to pack them out. So you need a critical mass around our political leaders, and that is part of the success story of Rwanda. President Kagame is not doing so well because of himself alone, but because he has a critical mass around him that started in Uganda, gave themselves a, a mission when they uh, got back, and they are delivering. Uh, so yeah, okay. I agree with uh, Dr. Odewale's I mean, uh, thrust on this I mean, issue. We need to be more strategic. And uh, uh, the issue of education that he mentioned earlier, quality education needs a total revolution because many of us have become victims of a new colonial educational system, which is rather alienating us from the people. And as our other brother mentioned, we are not doing bottom up. We believe in top down approach because of our comfort zones. Mm -hmm. A revolution of the educational content and pedagogy is going to be very critical. And again, conversations, please. We rely on you to help us along with others to make this I mean, shift. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now, Dr. Ingris, there's an African proverb that says that uh, if your neighbor's house is burning, you don't go and sleep uh, with your eyes closed. Uh, we have a question from a member of the audience. It says, is the African Union the most suitable institution for security decisions uh, on the continent or are sub-regional entities, regional blocs like ECOWAS, SADAC, uh, the EAC, are they more suitable to addressing uh, some of these issues because it's uh, smaller, uh, they're smaller blocks? Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Ingus. Go ahead, please. Yes, I think the EU is the is rather suitable for um, resolving the armed conflicts in Africa, which produces the insurgents to emerge most of the time. But you have the problem of supremacy in some African countries. Whenever the EU tries to, and uh, I, I wouldn't say intervene, but whenever the EU tries to contribute to the peaceful settlements of African complex. So how can you resolve this issue of supremacy when you want it to go into the into Somalia, into Ethiopia, into um, yeah, many Horn of African countries? And you have we have seen that the Horn of African complex have become a kind of uh, unending. Whenever you resolve one issue in Horn of Africa, say so Sudan, you will see Ethiopia emerging as a complex hidden zone. And then you resolve this conflict and you will see Somalia again conflict starts. And you will see Sudan as well, yeah, sometimes other African whole of African countries. So and and this is not something typical or and confined to the Horn of Africa. We have seen West Africa, we have seen Central Africa, we have seen Southern Africa, we have seen North Africa, everywhere in Africa. Although some places are more prone to armed, armed conflict and insurgents than each other. And those countries are countries that uses extremely or deeply in the notion of uh, zero-sum games or winner takes all. You cannot resolve African conflicts uh, just through the battle ground or war from. You need other assessments because mm -hmm. African culture has been based on a culture of consensus, consensus and compromise Community. through the East. Mm -hmm. Africa is not like in, uh, uh, countries in other places in the world where you can achieve yeah, through war, uh, you can, where you can achieve peace and stability through war. If you if you try to resolve these issues, uh, for example, the ambassador talking about Ethiopia, when the EU AU achieved to resolve the issues in the north, Tigray, uh, the, the Amhara came to armed conflict, the Oromo uprising, you have it in Ethiopia. So you resolve this issue, then another one starts. So you need to have some sort of a comprehensive political settlements and on a continental level, as well as the regional level, as well as the local level. So you have to have strategize yeah, those points. 
That's what I would add, those ideas, organic ideas. Now, Dr. Idris, still staying, uh, Dr. Ingris, still staying with you. Uh, there's an African standby force, uh, intervention uh, force by the African Union. How effective is it? Uh, we've not seen its operations uh, used. Uh, would it, is it something that we should look at developing uh, as a more effective tool to uh, silence in the guns and conflict resolution in the model of NATO? Because uh, uh, NATO's Article 10 says an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, would it act as a deterrent, knowing that, you know, the African Union does have this really strong uh, standby force that is made up of countries, member state countries, and, you know, if there's serious uh, conflict or threats of a genocide or anything, it can be deployed to uh, solve conflict. How important is it to build that capacity? Yes, and uh, I think we can create this kind of capacity that the NATO and the EU has and, uh, by accumulating our resources together. But we have to have to create a kind of trust within the, the EU as a mutative institution representing all of Africa. And uh, I think the EU and, uh, needed to concentrate on the level of state building, peace building, and nation building mechanisms. If there is a kind of mass massacres, or whatever you call it, genocide or whatever, we have a moral responsibility to intervene in everywhere in Africa. But you have to have a standing by force, but not to in intervene when there is a kind of a, a political conflict uh, between an, a government, an insurgency group trying to overthrow. Uh, that is not the kind of the, the moral responsibility that you can go. What you can do in those instances or circumstances is you can and, uh, and, uh, keep peace. If they come to the negotiating table, if they uh, negotiate among or between themselves or being mediated by the AU themselves, the AU has to be balanced, impartial and objective to all those who are fighting, not just to side one group or the other. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, we have to have some sort of a, an, um, an African, as, as we say, most of the time. We have to practice this kind of a, a slogan that we always use as a pan African. It is African solution to African problem. So how can we do this? We have to have a concrete, mm. comprehensive, and concise strategy uh, yeah, to face and deal with this kind of African solution to African problems in, on, on a reality basis and based on, on the ground. Field. Thank you, Dr. Ingris. Uh, now, Dr. Njewale, we have a question, uh, still following up on uh, what Dr. Ingris said on African solutions to African problems. Sometimes uh, when the Africans are not providing the solutions, they're external actors uh, for different geopolitical reasons. They support the one uh, side of the conflict against the other. Uh, we have a question here from a member of the audience. It says, uh, there are foreign actors providing warring parties with guns and logistics, and this is uh, that there is evidence of this in this active uh, conflict in Sudan. There are some foreign actors who support uh, the RSF uh, of uh, Mohammed Amdan Daglo and also the Sudanese armed forces led by General Bohan. Uh, there are African countries that might uh, support some of these factions and their external forces too, like I said. Uh, the question is, how do we stop this uh, foreign actors, how do we stop uh, foreign actors from intervening in conflicts and thereby prolonging and you know, fueling it? Well, that's a very critical one because um, I think uh, the nature of human interaction implies that there will always be conflict, whether at individual level or at uh, strategic uh, national or international level. So how do we stop the, inter um, the influence of foreign actors? Uh, I, I don't really think that should be our cardinal objective. What should be our cardinal objective is um, ensuring that um, conflicts are actually addressed at frozen states. And I'm using that word carefully because um, you hear people talking about violent conflict. What it implies is that you can have conflict without violence. When you have conflict at a frozen state, before it defreezes, you 
you tackle it, you address uh, the drivers, the enablers, the fault lines. So if you are able to do that, you have not provided an incentive for foreign actors to actually get involved. Why am I saying that? Is there any conflict going on in the world now that you don't have foreign actors? I mean, <laughs> American is exporting and we are, I mean, sending arms to Ukraine. It's, it's an open secret. It's not a closed secret. And then and, and Russia, Putin is also moving around to see how he can aggregate the interest of American enemies in court is going to North Korea, is going to Iran. <laughs> so you have foreign actors at that other head. And I don't think African situation is going to be different. What we really need to do, I keep emphasizing, is the power, is elevating the power of the African agency. So we have talked about the direction of harms now. Don't also forget that shared global conversation also frame what goes on around conflict across the world. So for instance, I have the ambassador talking about building a coalition of think tanks. Um, this question does not address it directly, but I should also, in my intervention, make reference to this. I think what the AU should also do is to strengthen the state that has been created to give voices to African public and academic intellectuals to actually frame the issues in African context. Most times what you see is people going to charter mouse, people going to council on foreign relations. These are established think tanks that write about African affairs. But how many African voices do you have on those platforms? We appreciate what conversation is doing and then, but we need more of that at strategic level, like uh, he's talking about bringing um, a platform where African think tanks can actually frame African stories, African development. This is what is also going to show that we are a people that are capable of thinking about our own solutions. We are a people that are capable of framing our issues and framing the solutions that they require. So I think it's something that we need to look at at broader level. What we have not seen is that most of the times when foreign actors come to meddle in African affairs, we are appearing or presenting or projecting ourselves as a weak version of who we are supposed to be. That is what you so don't see in most contexts. So, and it begins with how we begin to also elevate our own voices, projecting ourselves to be serious nations who are capable of addressing our own internal contradictions. So I think this is my um, little um, response to the question that is raised. There is no conflict that you are going to have that is not going to have um, the influence of foreign actors. But what is very, very important is that we must develop the agency, the courage and the capital to address conflict at frozen states before they escalate to violence. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jovale. Dr. Ambassador, as we begin to wrap up uh, this session, uh, my question to you, you've talked about what the African Union is doing about the about silence in the grounds. You mentioned in your opening uh, remarks. There are currently there are active conflicts that are ongoing uh, on the continent, uh, we do understand how the United Nations Security Council works. Uh, its members raise resolutions and then point of orders, and then this resolution is passed. Uh, how does the African Union work? And I ask this because of the nature of the active conflict in Sudan that has been going on for uh, six years. And also, uh, Dr. Ingris mentioned uh, the little, not little, the skirmishes involving the Oromia and other uh, issues in the um, uh, in Ethiopia and other places, Somalia, for example, uh, do they discuss this at the continental level? How regularly do they discuss uh, the state of security on the continent on the at the AU? And uh, is it just a discussion, or are they actively sending on voice and looking for ways to silence the guns in these places where we have uh, active conflicts? Yeah, thank you very much for, again, this very relevant uh, question. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the African Union is uh, using its Peace and Security Council to respond to these active uh, conflicts. So as you know, the member states ambassadors uh, in Addis Ababa are accredited to the African Union in addition to uh, Ethiopia and sometimes concurrently accredited to uh, neighboring African countries. 
Uh, I should also mention in person that uh, 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 in the case of uh, Morocco in uh, Africa and uh, some of our partner countries like uh, China, uh, US, I don't know which other, have actually found it necessary to have two ambassadors, one to Ethiopia bilateral and one dedicated mm -hmm. To the African, Union. African Union. And moving forward, this very pertinent question you have raised, um, I think we need to begin to think about that. As, uh, even to the level of our RECs, that you have an office that is also, whether it is a hybrid format or separate, I mean, because the work of the AU alone is huge. And uh, being the bilateral is also another huge one. But having said that, it's the AU Peace and Security Council, just like the U.S. Security Council, that uh, handles our uh, active conflict situations. And as you asked, I mean, they meet regularly, and the matter is um, uh, discussed. And where appropriate, um, uh, apart from taking certain decisions, they also do follow-up action, including engaging in field visits. So the um, uh, field uh, PSC. Uh, missions, just as the commission itself, through uh, Commissioner DOE's department, also fills uh, filled missions to those conflict zones as well. I will give you one quick example where um, uh, Commissioner DOE was in Chad and then from there to Ouagadougou. And in the case of Burkina Faso, I mean, the host authorities arranged for his delegation to be taken to the boundary zone where you have. Uh, these terrorists controlling territory and um, the rest of uh, the country. And it was quite an experience. Um, so it's not that uh, our leaders just talk about it. I mean, there is also action I mean, on that. Sometimes our communication also needs to be improved for our citizens to know exactly what is going on. And again, this is where the importance of having a strategic partnership with your of an entity will be critical moving forward, not just with the African Union, but also with um, ECOWAS and directly also with some of uh, the member states. Let me also quickly add this. It's Doug Hammarskjöld, former UN Secretary General, who said, the UN is created not to take member states to heaven, but to keep them away from hell. So when we have certain expectations of the African Union, of our RECs, Let's also remember that the member states have a certain responsibility. So you take the case of uh, Liberia, I mean, uh, AU and in particular ECOWAS helped to keep them away from hell, isn't it? You recall ECOMOG? Yes. Out of the ashes of ECOMOG. Out of the ashes of ECOMOG, what did we get? The first female president of Liberia, um, of Africa, sorry. As we speak, the Liberian elections, which is one of the priorities of the uh, uh, Commissioner's Department, elections management, you can see that in the case of the ongoing uh, Liberian elections, uh, in terms of the accounting process, if the time they take to do the counting, if this had happened in some other countries, like Ghana and elsewhere, you can imagine what would have happened. But see how peaceful it has been. I mean, the citizens are not complaining about it. They patiently waited. The results are out. I mean, we are not hearing of any violence and things like that. That's major progress. We saw the similar in uh, Zambia I mean, uh, with the support of the AU mediation, peaceful. Gambia with a support, a facilitation of AU, I mean, a peaceful exit of uh, Yaya Jame, which would otherwise have been... Uh, a, a, a bloody one. So AU is making an effort, I mean, along with uh, the Rex. But at the end of the day, it is the responsibility of national stakeholders to keep their countries safe. Uh, governments of member states have the primary responsibility of peace and security in their countries. It is only when you are moving towards uh, um, atrocity and genocidal levels that the Rex and the AU. I mean, are obliged to take action, as was done in the uh, ECOMOC um, in Liberia, which has become mm -hmm. the first responsibility to protect type of intervention in the world. At that time, when it was done, led by Nigeria, it was criticized that it was not a legal exercise. But see what 
it did uh, move forward. So my plea to us uh, African citizens is that while we hold the AU and Rex to account, let us also make sure that our um, in the, within the member states, we are holding state institutions, governments, and public servants to account to make sure that we build resilience such that we don't have to look up to Rex and to the AU to come in and help. And that goes for what is happening now, the resurgence of unconstitutional changes of government. It is the responsibility of national stakeholders. If Nigeria, people are not seeing cool to be likely, if Ghana, people are not seeing cool to be likely, it was not the work of ECOWAS. It was not the work of the African mm -hmm. Union. It was the work of the national stakeholders who said enough is enough. So I, I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Ambassador, we do appreciate uh, your time. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we draw the curtains on today's uh, virtual dialogue brought to you by the Conversation Africa on insurgencies in Africa, silence in the gods. I'd like to say a very big thank you to our distinguished panelist, Ambassador William Winado Kanyurige, African Union Senior Advisor on Governance and Peace Building. I uh, would also like to say a big thank you to Dr. Uluwale Ojewale uh, of the Institute of Security Studies. And um, lastly, our third uh, distinguished panelist who apologized, so he sends his apologies uh, for not staying with us uh, through the end, but I believe he answered all the questions uh, brilliantly. Uh, Professor Mohamed Aji Ingris. Uh, a research Fellow of Conflict uh, Research Program at the London School of Economics. Uh, distinguished guests, thank you uh, for your questions, uh, the members of the audience. Uh, you can always uh, go back and watch the uh, session on Facebook. I believe it's on uh, Facebook and uh, other platforms. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, being your moderator on behalf of the Conversation Africa, I say thank you uh, to you all for uh, joining and uh, I look forward to engaging in the future. Uh, keep following uh, Conversation Africa for more updates on the next uh, webinar. Uh, thank you and have a beautiful day. Bye bye.